Good evening, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to join us for this webinar, which is being brought to you by AHTB Dairy and AHTB Beef and Lamb. My name is Derek Armstrong, and I'm your chair for this evening. I'm the veterinary lead at AHTB Dairy. Tonight's webinar is on Mycoplasma bovis, and our presenter will be Colin Mason. The webinar has proved very popular, and we've had 260 registrations from across the spectrum of the dairy industry, from farmers, vets, nutritionists, consultants, and researchers. I'm delighted to introduce Colin Mason. Colin is the Veterinary Centre Manager at the SRUC Disease Surveillance Centre in Dumfries. After qualifying, he spent five years in farm animal practice in Cheshire before joining SAC in 2000. He obtained his RCVS Certificate in Cattle Health and Production in 1999 and is a member of the UK Cattle Expert Group advising on national surveillance for endemic and emerging cattle diseases. He's also a member of the Sainsbury's Dairy Development Group Expert Vets Team and a licensed plan user for the AHDB Dairy Mastitis Control Plan. So without further ado, over to you, Colin. Uh, people have heard enough from me and our theme for this evening, Mycoplasma bovis in cattle. Thank you very much, Derek, and thanks to AHDB for the opportunity to speak this evening on Mycoplasma bovis. Um, certainly, the disease seems to be one that is uh, increasingly topical and for, for some producers, maybe a, a significant disease challenge that they face on farms. Uh, it is certainly, we believe, an increasingly common disease uh, with a range of disease presentations and uh, what I want to do this evening as part of my talk is is basically review a little bit about what is going on out there, the diagnostic trend data, what data we have on the disease um, uh, and, and some of the feedback that we get from veterinary practitioners and farmers. Um, I want to look in a little bit more detail at some of the basics, not too much science um, for this time on a Monday evening, but some of the basics on uh, the organism involved, um, how it infects cattle, uh, and how we can detect it through diagnostics. I want to talk about uh, some of the key clinical disease features uh, for people to look out for that we can expect to get from this disease, um, and then focus in the, the second half of my talk on the, the critical control points for the disease, uh, how we can try and uh, control the disease to best effect, what works, what is the evidence for it. I'll touch a little bit on treatment, although I fully acknowledge that uh, that is, is going to be between pharma and their own veterinary surgeon, but a few comments on that. And then at the very end, uh, a few comments on some experiences with vaccination as well to, to end the talk off. So that's where we want to go. So moving on, just some of the very basics. Um, Mycoplasma um, are bacteria, they're a particular type of molecule bacteria and there's probably around 120, 130 of these species affecting animals uh, worldwide. They're, they're, they're relatively common organisms and quite a diverse range of organisms. Somewhere around 12 Mycoplasma species affect cattle. Um, uh, some don't necessarily cause significant disease uh, and some uh, of which Mycoplasma bovis is one will cause a range of disease syndromes in cattle. Um, a couple of basics about the organism itself which uh, are relevant to how we manage and control it. One is, is, is unlike most bacteria, the organisms don't have a cell wall. Um, uh, you may think, so what? But that has an implication for what antibiotics we can use that will work. Some of the, you know, the antibiotics that are commonly used, for example penicillins, work against bacterial cell walls. So um, in the case of mycoplasma, because they don't have one, for example penicillins will not work uh, against these particular organisms. So we have a narrower range of antibiotics that we can choose to kill these organisms. Um, they're also, like, like most bacteria, they've adapted and developed mechanisms to sort of dodge the cow's immune system, um, uh, changes to the proteins on the surface of the organism and the ability for them to produce what we call biofilms, which is how I describe it really is a sort of sticky carbohydrate layer around about them, uh, are very good ways that we can avoid the cow's immune system and, and have some bearing on where we may see chronic disease with these organisms uh, caused by these organisms. So. We know Mycoplasma bovis is a recognized bovine pathogen. Um, uh, it's probably only recently been recognized, maybe in the 70s it was recognized as a, as a bovine pathogen in the UK. Um, going back 
into previous years, it was quite hard to detect and it required specific culture mechanisms to detect it. Sometimes they took two to three weeks to complete um, uh, and the organisms weren't picked up by the sort of routine bacterial cultures that we might use, for example, for, for milk samples. Um, uh, the organisms are now more easily detectable using a range of different techniques, some of them more modern molecular techniques, some of them maybe simpler cultural techniques. So the organisms are easier to find. Um, we've also known since the, the 70s and perhaps before that this organism was part of the pneumonia complex, the, the range of bacteria that will cause pneumonia in cattle. Uh, but as always, um, pneumonia is a multifactorial disease and there have been some questions over the role of M. bovis um, uh, you know, as a a cause of pneumonia in every case. Uh, maybe it was just happened to be an organism that was hanging around at the scene of the crime. But we now also recognize that M. bovis will cause specific disease pathologies in the lungs um, uh, that, that relate to M. bovis. And I'll show you some of those later on. So we now know specific diseases that they cause, um, that it causes. We now have uh, mechanisms to detect it fairly readily. Um, uh, which then poses the question is, you know, what is going on? Um, uh, we know there's increased vet and pharma reporting of these cases. We see uh, increased reporting of chronic pneumonias, for example, in dairy calves. Uh, we see increased reporting uh, of uh, some of the ear, middle ear conditions that we, we see in M. bovis cases, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. Uh, if you leaf through any of the farming press and the veterinary press, there will be more mention of M. bovis in recent years. Um, there has been increased interest in the organisms um, uh, uh, by pharmaceutical companies. Um, so my question really would be, is, is, is there just increasing awareness of the problem through the uh, easier to detect mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, or is it an increasing problem? And I, I would argue throughout this presentation that, that it probably is an increasing problem. Some of the UK surveillance data you can see on the, the red graph on the right shows uh, that we have had an increasing number of diagnoses made um, uh, over recent years. This is, uh, we accept the tip of the iceberg in terms of the number of cases that are occurring out there, um, uh, but this is UK data that shows an increase. And uh, some more local data to where I am is, is, is that if we look at antibody levels in calves that have been affected by pneumonia, looking at the range of different organisms that might cause it, uh, Mycoplasma bovis comes in as, as number two uh, as one of the more significant causes of pneumonia in calves that have had a clinical presentation with pneumonia. So putting all that together, we have quite a bit of uh, information, either direct information or supportive information to suggest that this is an emerging and an increasing problem, uh, particularly on dairy farms. So just to start off on some of the clinical presentations, this is one recent case um, uh, which describes some of the syndromes quite nicely. Um, uh, you'll see that it has uh, one droopy ear um, uh, which wasn't responding to any treatment. Um, in this particular group of calves, this was seen fairly commonly. Um, uh, and also there was a history of, of some chronic pneumonias in the group and poor growth rates. Um, uh, sometimes we see these ear droops um, uh, with a degree of paralysis of the face um, uh, and a slight head tilt might be seen as well. Uh, and we find that these cases very often are quite difficult to treat. So for vets in practice, um, uh, these come into the, the problem case category, which are not easily resolved. Uh, and this will be one of the, the common clinical presentations. Now, when we looked at this calf, um, it, was, it was put to sleep and uh, examined post-mortem. Um, uh, and you can see, um, uh, I'll highlight it with the arrow, this is the middle ear here. Um, uh, and you can see areas of, of chronic polyolent material within the ear canal there. Um, which is evidence of, of middle ear disease in this particular calf. Um, uh, it can present as, as ear pain and head shaking. Uh, as I said, an ear droop uh, can be either one-sided or potentially both-sided. It's quite rare that you get a discharge from the ears. Um, uh, usually the, the ears seem fairly clean, although it can occur on some situations. And on occasions we can get secondary nervous disease with this as well. Um, when you look at more detail of this calf, not only did it have middle ear disease, but it had uh, a degree of pneumonia as well. And this is something that we see commonly in a lot of dairy bred calves. You can see the area of red lung highlighted here um, as a piece of the lung lobes, which is, is pneumonic. Uh, 
against more healthy lung tissue to the right. And this combination of, of ear disease and chronic recurrent pneumonia, quite often with a, a significant number of calves affected, but not necessarily with many of them actually dying, is a common presentation. Um, there is often a, an incomplete uh, response to treatment, and, and sometimes we see relapses with these cases as well. And I, I would imagine for, for vets and for farmers listening to this right now, you know, these are uh, situations that we would recognize in our dairy farmers, probably more common than we used to do. Okay, another situation that we see quite commonly uh, when we get people bringing cases into our center here for post-mortem, uh, we'll talk to the farmer when they drop the case off, and uh, the farmer will quite commonly report that you know, this was a, a sudden death. Um, uh, the calf drank its milk the night before. Uh, it didn't drink its milk the following morning and was dead later on that day. Um, and I would always acknowledge and recognize that farmers are very good usually at detecting pneumonia. We, we recognize the signs of pneumonia quite readily. Uh, and farmers are very, very good at picking it up. Um, and when we open these calves up, we quite often see a set of lungs like the, the picture we see here, um, uh, where we have a lot of areas of white caseous material. Um, uh, and this is actually caused, uh, called a, a casea necrotic pneumonia, um, which is a, a type of pneumonia that is linked specifically to Mycoplasma bovis, or most commonly to Mycoplasma bovis, um, uh, and is also uh, very chronic. It, this has not been acute death at all. This is a calf that has been affected for some considerable period of time and yet has maybe not shown the classical signs of pneumonia that we would expect, maybe slightly more ill-thriven with a chronic pneumonia. So uh, this is a common presenting sign that we will see with Mycoplasma bovis. I have to also point out that, that one of the other things, uh, particularly in the southwest of the country that we'd have to be aware of with this is the possibility of TB with this sort of presentation. But uh, probably more commonly, and certainly uh, in Scotland, um, we would be thinking about Mycoplasma bovis as one of the more common presenting signs here, a chronic Cady necrotic pneumonia, uh, and when you see lungs like this, it, it's very easy to understand how these calves are real thriven. You will get a poor response to treatment because of the nature of the damage to the lungs that are there, uh, and these calves will, will, will not do well and will relapse from time to time. Um, if you look at the, the, the two pictures on the right, when you actually look under a microscope at these um, white areas um, of, of, of lung tissue, uh, you can see the caseous material on the slide there, um, uh, and then actually when you actually label that uh, looking for the pathogen itself, these brown areas here are the Mycoplasma bovis organisms, so it demonstrates really nicely that you've got the organism at the scene of the crime causing the problem. So Mycoplasma pneumonia, uh, a common problem. So what I always like to think about is, is how does this infection get into calves? How do we set this infection up? Uh, in, in the first instance, and I always like to imagine a scenario where we've got a brand new calf house. Uh, it's never had animals in it before, it's never had calves in it before, and we're introducing calves into that environment for the first time. Um, uh, so how would Mycoplasma bovis infection first get into that environment? Um, and there was a couple of routes, um, one significant, one less so. I'll, I'll take the less significant route first, which is it can certainly get in um, potentially the calves, if they're born to a Mycoplasma bovis infected cow, then they may be born infected themselves. Um, uh, this is not necessarily the most common route of infection, but it is possible. Uh, also, the calving environment potentially can harbor Mycoplasma bovis, uh, and there has been some work showing that M. bovis can survive in sand, um, uh, uh, although there's been less conclusive work on other areas of bedding, but uh, there's the potential that the calves might pick it up in the calving environment, but, but more likely um, if there is Mycoplasma bovis infection in the cows, the way the infection is going to get into the calves is through milk, cow's milk or colostrum. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that the cow is mastitic, um, and I'll come on to Mycoplasma bovis mastitis as a separate entity in a minute, um, uh, but Mycoplasma bovis might well be carried within the milk. Um, uh, the milk might be perfectly normal, uh, the colostrum might be perfectly normal, but it will contain M. bovis, and that will set up uh, a new round of infection within the calf crop. 
And that's probably how it gets in. And later on in the talk, that will relate back to some of the, the key control measures that we can employ. Obviously, once it's in a, a calf environment, um, uh, then it can spread very readily between calves. Calves coughing um, uh, will, will, will fire the organism out into the environment. They'll breathe it out. Uh, and one of the problems that we have with our, our modern calf rearing systems is for a lot of year-round calving dairy herds, we're on a production line. There are new calves coming along all the time, possibly moving into environments where there are older calves. Uh, and if there is pneumonia in the older calves, then there is clearly the potential for that to then spread onto the younger calves. So direct contact between calves, aerosols through coughing and breathing, and also fomites. What I mean by fomites is, is certain things that the calves might come into contact with that will carry mycoplasma bovis. So milk utensils, milk handling utensils, teats, gloves, hands, humans, whatever, can act as fomites spreading the organism um, uh, between calves as well. So that's a little bit about how the disease might spread within a group of calves and get into a group of calves. And there's been some interesting experimental work done. The picture on the right just shows the lungs, the trachea, and at the bottom of the picture, the upper respiratory um, uh, larynx, tonsils, etc. But there's been some work done in the States that showed really nicely that if you feed calves mycoplasma bovis infected milk, um, uh, which is not an uncommon scenario occurring on our dairy farms, then by 14 days of age, if they've been fed milk for that period of time, then there will be 100% consul- um, uh, infection uh, con- uh, of, of the calf group. So basically, by two weeks old, all the calves that were fed the contaminated milk had become infected with mycoplasma bovis. That doesn't mean they're all going to go on and get disease. It just means that the transmission of the organism to the calf has occurred and these calves are now infected and, and potentially might get disease, potentially might be a source of infection to other calves. So it's a very efficient route of getting infection into the, the calves in the first place. Um, we think that the infection gets in to the tonsils, uh, and you could probably easily understand from there how it could get into the middle ear and cause the, the ear disease that we see probably more commonly in dairy calves now than we used to. Um, uh, from the upper respiratory tract, it can either sit there with or without disease, um, or it can spread down into the lungs, potentially, depending on other factors that are going on in the calf. The organism can, can spread um, uh, within the bloodstream, and that's possibly how it can settle out in the other tissue, causing mastitis, or, or settle out within joints, causing arthritis. So it's easy to see how it might spread within the body. Um, uh, and we recognize that the respiratory tract, both the lungs and the upper respiratory tract, and probably the mammary gland are the main sites where um, the organism might remain within infected animals. We know once an animal is infected that it can shed the organism for a period of months, certainly um, uh, stretching potentially out to years. They can be shedding us for quite a long period of time. Interestingly enough, sat here in January, there was some work that showed that, that shedding was worse in colder weather. Um, uh, and one of the things that I think we would recognize, which I think is important for, for us all to consider, is, is, is that there are probably different disease states existing in a farm at any one time. So probably pneumonia might be the more common, middle ear disease might be occurring, there may be the degree of arthritis there as well in calves or cows, um, uh, and there may be different disease presentations occurring at different times. So some some key take-home messages for the pneumonia syndrome and the middle ear disease syndrome, which are kind of linked together uh, for the purposes of this talk. Um, this is probably the most common clinical presentation of the disease. Um, uh, so it, mycoplasma bovis is commonly found associated with pneumonia, uh, and, and potentially it could easily be missed if we if we don't use the right diagnostics, and I'll move on to that a little bit later on in my talk. Um, so I, I would suggest that M. bovis should at least be considered as part of the investigation of, of respiratory disease um, uh, pretty much in every situation. Um, I think vets and farmers need to be considering and looking out for chronic disease in particular uh, with possibilities of relapses, uh, particularly in dairy calves, uh, often associated with a significant ill thrift or poor weight gain. Uh, there can be variable response to treatment uh, depending on situation, 
and it can at times be associated with, with high levels of antibiotic use to try and bring it under control. Uh, this casein necrotic pneumonia that I showed you a picture of is a not uncommon finding in some of these calves, um, uh, and as is middle ear disease and arthritis. I, I think for, for farmers, with any of these situations, discussing pneumonia control and diagnosis with your vet is important. Um, uh, obviously, pneumonia can be caused by a, a range of viruses and bacteria, etc. So, embobus is not necessarily the whole story, but might well be part of it. Um, I think it's really important that the vet pharma team reviews their antibiotic use and their antibiotic choice, considering whether embobus might be involved and, and what the best selection of antibiotics is. Uh, and also, if embobus is involved, is, is to look specifically at what the control strategies are to limit disease spread and limit disease incursion in the first place um, uh, so that we're you know, using the minimum number of treatments uh, that we need to. Um, uh, and more on that later. Uh, I'd also signpost you at this stage to um, the AHDB dairy um, resources on their website. There's a lot of stuff on there on um, uh, the preventative control management of uh, disease spreading carbs that's worth looking at. Um, so I just put this slide up uh, looking at the range of disease presentations that we get with mycoplasma bovis. I've focused so far on the first two red ones, that's pneumonia and middle ear disease. Clearly there's a range of others as well, um, uh, pharyngitis, laryngitis, again upper respiratory tract problems eye problems, conjunctivitis, um, uh, there's also been mention of mycoplasma bovis in association with blind quarters in heifers, not blind quarters in heifers, apologies for that, uh, meningitis, cardiac disease, abortion, but probably the ones in red are the most common ones, pneumonia, middle ear disease, arthritis and mastitis, and I'll make mention of, of arthritis and mastitis a little bit more. Uh, now, so firstly, mycoplasma bovis arthritis. I thought maybe it was easiest to describe this one as a real case example. Uh, this is a fairly dramatic case example uh, of how M. bovis arthritis can take hold. Um, uh, and I'm not suggesting that this is the way it occurs in, in every scenario. Um, uh, but this is, is one example. This is um, a dairy herd, um, uh, not a closed dairy herd, uh, a reasonably large dairy herd. Um, they were purchasing some in-calf heifers uh, prior to this outbreak of disease. They weren't using any vaccines and uh, were BVD free. Um, uh, earlier last year, they had an increased incidence of lameness uh, noted with swollen joints, mainly fetlocks and hocks. Um, uh, the thinking was is that it wasn't linked to significant cubicle damage, which obviously can be one of the other causes of, of, of swollen hocks, for example. And in association with this flare-up of disease, there was also a rise in cell count and a rise in their clinical mastitis rate, which you know, historically and consistently have been very low, and they suddenly saw a flare-up in their clinical mastitis rate as well. So something was clearly going on, and, and it was fairly dramatic in presentation. And uh, uh, when the vet took some joint taps, some, some samples of the fluid within the joint, and those were cultured from mycoplasma bovis. They all cultured positive, so it confirmed that that was the diagnosis. Um, also looking at mastitic milk samples, some of those tested positive for mycoplasma bovis. And the upshot of it was is, is, is that there was around 26 animals treated for arthritis. Uh, the very worst of them didn't respond to treatment and had to be culled. Um, uh, a range of treatments were used. Um, and quite a lot of those cows did have some degree of ongoing arthritis, uh, although many of them uh, actually managed to cope with it reasonably well and, and did improve clinically, uh, such that they were still usable animals that weren't suffering. So uh, again, thinking of all of that, quite a dramatic disease presentation, um, uh, and not something that, that, that any dairy farmer will bet would miss at all. Um, one of the interesting things, looking at this in a bit more detail, is, is, is that we were thinking that maybe this was, was brought on by the purchase of animals, and maybe that was the reason why we suddenly had this flare-up of disease, and you know, an index case might have been one of the purchased animals into the herd. Um, uh, but looking at the picture as a whole, um, uh, and looking at the herd as a whole, um, there was evidence that both homebred and purchased cattle were affected um, by either mastitis or arthritis. Um, 
we knew, for example, the calves were being fed cow's milk for the first four or five days of life. And there was some degree of clinical pneumonia in the calves, and there was the odd case of arthritis in the calves. So there was some clinical evidence to suggest that Mbovis was involved with other disease presentations on the farm. And when we did a little bit of follow-up looking at um, antibodies for Mbovis, looking at exposure to Mbovis that has occurred in, in the different groups, um, uh, affected cows and healthy cows, there was evidence of exposure to, exposure to Mbovis, um, uh, bulling heifers similarly, and also young calves similarly. So one of the questions with this really is, is did the purchased animals introduce the disease or possibly and possibly more likely, was the disease present in the herd anyway, and there was some other stress factor or risk factor that exacerbated the disease at this particular time. Um, uh, probably the, the latter might be more likely. So a few thoughts on Mbovis arthritis. Certainly these severe outbreaks, and that's one of them that I just described there, um, they do occur, and uh, when they occur, they can be quite troublesome in terms of management and treatment. Um, uh, but these outbreaks are, are probably less common uh, thankfully. Um, I would say usually with these there will be other disease presentations on the farm, either calf disease or, or possibly mastitis. Um, my concern a little bit is, is, is that maybe some of the more sporadic low numbers of mycoplasma bovis arthritis cases on some dairy farms might be missed. Uh, they could be overlooked as another cause of lameness or possibly as a, a cubicle injury or a hock injury or something like that. Uh, so that in Mbovis infected herds, we do have arthritis occurring, but it's not uh, at a significant level um, and is, is maybe part of the whole disease presentation as the whole thing. Um, associated with the purchase trigger has been, been some, when we've looked at some of these outbreaks over the years, that has been one of the risk factors is a purchase of cattle, possibly purchasing cattle from, from multiple sources has been a trigger to uh, a flare-up of mycoplasma bovis arthritis, uh, which raises the question of, of how can we limit that and what biosecurity screening can we use to, to limit that disease incursion, and I'll mention that a little bit later on. And as I said in the case example, and, and it would apply to a lot of cases as well, is, is that some animals will respond poorly to treatment. If you look at the picture of the right of this, this is an animal the very chronic mycoplasma bovis arthritis um, that was euthanized on welfare grounds. Um, uh, uh, and you can see the extent of the, the damage that's occurring um, in and around the joint associated with mycoplasma bovis. Um, so for some cases, the more severe cases, the, the treatment response will be poor, um, but there will be other cases less severely affected that will manage quite well. Very quick mention of mycoplasma bovis mastitis. Um, uh, don't want to get too bogged down in mastitis uh, as part of this talk, but, but just to make mention that it is a potential cause of mycoplasma bovis mastitis, a potential cause of mastitis. But if you look at the graph on the right here, looking at you know for UK diagnoses, um, uh, mycoplasma bovis is not a significant cause of mastitis uh, compared to some of the usual suspects: E. coli, strep uberus, Staph aureus, etc. But it is there. Also. Um, on certain farms, it can be a significant problem. The pie chart at the bottom shows one particular farm where the purple bit of the pie here and the pinky purple bit is, is the, the total number of mycoplasma bovis cases that occurred on this farm. And from 132 clinical mastitis samples on this farm, a third of them were down to Mbovis. So whilst maybe the national picture is such that it's not a big deal or not a, a major deal, um, on certain farms, it can be a problem. I think the, the things to, to consider for mycoplasma bovis mastitis is be aware of the clinical signs. Um, they will be unresponsive to conventional treatment, and I accept also that you know, some Staph aureus and Strep uberus and other mastitis cases will also be unresponsive or poorly responsive to treatment, but M. bovis cases will not respond well. Uh, you'll occasionally get some milk changes. Um, uh, people have described sort of sandy gravelly type of milk associated with it, but that's not always the case. Also bear in mind, given what I said at the start of the talk, that milk can be a source of mycoplasma infection to the calves and the milk might be perfectly normal. So you may get culture or PCR positive milk samples from asymptomatic carriers from animals that don't have mastitis, but are carrying embobus in their milk, but are actually clinically normal. 
so we've got to balance those two things up uh, and really relate it to the clinical picture. I think that's the most important thing. Um, uh, treatment will not work well. Um, uh, and the best way to manage these cases is to segregate uh, and ultimately to cull them on the assumption that they will not respond to treatment and will act as a significant source of infection to other animals within the herd. Um, in the States, mycoplasma bovis mastitis is considered to be a, a much more significant problem than it is in the UK. Uh, and the exact differences and the reasons why it's more of a problem in the US compared to the UK I'm not entirely sure, but uh, we don't seem to see the significant or the more significant problems that they get in the States over here. Uh, and again, I would argue that if we're getting M. bovis mastitis, then certainly have a good look and a good consideration that there may be other clinical presentations of mycoplasma bovis occurring in the herd as well. A quick mention on diagnostics um, uh, and how through the vets we can go about determining whether M. bovis is a significant cause of, of some of the clinical presentations that are, are going on. Um, uh, we've got to bear in mind that um, we need to test specifically for it. Um, uh, some of the routine culture techniques will not pick it up. Um, we need to also understand that M. bovis might be there in combination with, with other pathogens, particularly as part of the pneumonia complex, and it may be relevant or it may not. Uh, and really the most important thing is, is to link mycoplasma bovis, the detection of it, to disease. Um, one of the simplest ways of looking at it, um, uh, and this is used quite a lot to quite good effect, um, might be to look at a group of calves that have had a history of pneumonia, wait till they are six, probably six months of age or, or older, uh, and then collect blood samples from those calves, um, looking for antibodies to mycoplasma bovis. Um, and Whilst it doesn't provide you with a precise diagnosis, if you get a lot of those blood samples that test positive for mycoplasma bovis antibody associated with clinical disease that you've seen in the calves that might fit the picture, um, uh, chronic disease as they're described, maybe middle ear diseases they're described, then you've got very good supportive evidence that M. bovis is involved in the problem, although you've not detected the organism at the scene of the crime, but it probably gives you enough information to, to, to press on with, with considerations for control. Um, there are various different methods of, of detecting the organism specifically, either through culture or, or molecular techniques. Um, and, and one thing to consider if vaccine production is an option or an option that, that might be considered as part of a control plan for the farm is, is to do that, you need to identify the organism. And I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, mycoplasma bovis requires specific culture techniques if we're going to culture for it. And, and one of the battles that the, the laboratory scientists always face is the battle between identifying the mycoplasma and, and stopping overgrowth by other bacteria that might have been picked up in the swab, on the swab, in the sample. So using mycoplasma transport medium is really useful to try and collect those samples into a specific transport medium to ensure that we maximize our chances of, uh, of identifying the organism and, and reduce our chances of getting bacterial overgrowth by other organisms. So uh, really to summarize on the diagnostics, I would say that um, to find the organism at the scene of the crime gives us uh, you know, really good correlation and good evidence to suggest that the disease is significant in the herd. And probably the best samples to go for would be to consider post-mortem samples, animals that die um, uh, or chronically ill animals that might be euthanized on welfare grounds, um, mastitic milks um, uh, or joint samples collected by a vet from, from animals with, with arthritis and, and those are probably the ones to go for to give you maximum chances of identifying the organism, proving the link and then moving on into where we go in terms of control. I think the next slide is, is my take home messages and diagnostics which I've, I've probably already summarized there. Okay. A very quick mention on, on therapies, on treatments, um, and uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in this because my main take-home message with this is, you know, the antibiotic use and choice needs to be decided between vet and pharma at a farm level, um, uh, and that's where, you know, the decisions need to be made and, and M. bovis needs to be considered as part of that. Uh, and as part of that whole situation. So uh, it's not for me to say what is the best drug to use. Uh, it will vary from farm to farm. 
uh, and it definitely needs to be you know, a, a local decision on veterinary advice. Um, antimicrobials will remain a significant part of the control um, uh, of mycoplasma bovis for some time to come. Um, uh, and as I said at the start of the talk, um, there are some limitations in choice because of the nature of the organisms we're talking about. So uh, tetracyclines, macrolides, fluoroquinolones, fluorofilenicol are some of the organisms that will potentially work uh, because of the nature of the organism and the, the type of drug that we're talking about. Like all bacteria, there is evidence that is starting to emerge both in the UK and also um, in other countries as well that um, there is resistance to some of these antibiotics starting to develop. It is you know, the, the big issue that we all face and, and mycoplasma bovis is no exception to that. So we need to have that one borne in mind as well. Um, again, really by reviewing treatment outcomes, um, considering the potential for antimicrobial resistance with your vet uh, and potentially using laboratory techniques to assess that as well. So they need to be considered. There are always going to be concerns about what I would say are the, the mass medication routes, either prophylactic use of medicines in healthy animals or group medication um, uh, in um, groups of affected calves. Um, and we need to balance our use of antibiotics as vets um, uh, against maintaining animal welfare within the production systems that we have on farms. And that is a balance that needs to be taken and assessed and judged at a local level. Uh, between vet and pharma, uh, and really what we need to, to have is control systems that will work, and I'll move on to that in a second, uh, and also um, systems for detecting disease really, really early in the development so that we're picking these calves up as quickly as possible. If you remember that picture of the casey necrotic lungs that I showed you, uh, you know, that disease has been established for a long period of time, and if we could intervene earlier in that whole process, then we might have a much better chance of getting a more successful treatment outcome and also uh, limiting our use of antibiotics as responsibly as we can. Um, uh, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but you know, one of the things for the future is is, is to you know, look at considering early detection systems for pneumonia, you know, particularly calf pneumonia in dairy herds. There are some systems out there. There is clinical scoring systems. The, 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 the schematic on the left is from um, the Wisconsin uh, system in, in the US which is, is looking at certain clinical attributes uh, based on nasal discharge, eyes, ears, fecal score, um, used as an early detection system. Um, there are various behavioral scores that can be used and have been used experimentally looking at um, calf behavior, their group behavior, their posture, etc. Uh, as an early indicator. There are various ear tags that are now starting to appear on the market which can act as a, an early indicator of, of calf disease. Um, and also looking at the automatic feeding systems, looking at the feeding patterns, um, the, the feed intakes and the way that these calves drink through a 24 hour period might give us some, some scope for the future uh, and now in terms of, of how we might pick up calves more early. And uh, AHDB are um, actively funding research into this area at the moment uh, so that we can consider what the best early detection systems are for pneumonia in dairy carbs, um, so we might be able to intervene more quickly. So I think there is some scope there for the future. I think as part of any mycoplasma bovis control plan, we need to, to consider in detail what our um, main areas for control are. How can we limit the spread of this disease uh, by management, um, uh, by animal management, by housing, by hygiene, etc. Uh, and for any of these scenarios, once we know that Mbovis is involved, we need to go through this and see, well, what can we do on farms to try and limit the spread? Um, the first one always to consider is, is how can we stop the disease getting into the farm in the first place? Uh, and there are, and there will be mycoplasma bovis free farms out there. We don't know exactly where they are and, and who they are, but uh, keeping the disease out uh, and buying disease free stock would be a fantastic way of um, keeping the disease under control. Um, uh, a closed herd policy will work really well in that regard and I think more future work needs to be there on a UK basis, uh, you know, looking at what herds might be free of the disease um, uh, and how we might be spreading it when we're buying animals. One particular test that can be of use um, uh, when 
buying in animals, particularly if buying in animals that are joining the milking herd, um, uh, is there is a bought milk PCR test that can be used um, uh, to detect embobus in milk. Um, uh, if that's applied to, let's say, a group of freshly carved heifers that are, have entered the herd, then that can be used uh, as a way of, of seeing whether embobus is there within the milk sample and a given indicator, certainly, of whether the group might be affected or not, and then how things might be played out thereafter. So that offers some promise, and as potentially would nasopharyngeal swabbing, sticking a swab up the nose of calves to see whether they've been colonized or not with embobus gives an in initial heads up as to, to whether the disease might be there. Um, uh, but without doubt, a close herd policy, like so many diseases, will be the best approach to how we go. If we're looking at the young dairy calf scenario um, and looking at milk feeding, um, uh, right at the start or uh, fairly early on in the talk, we, we mentioned that the milk was a, a good source of the organism into a group of calves, milk and colostrum. So there are really some key take-home messages here if we're feeding milk is um, cow's milk is a great source of the organism, so ideally don't feed it. Um, uh, I'll mention colostrum in a second. Um, uh, what quite a lot of people will do is maybe not feed cow's milk to their heifers, but they'll feed cow's milk to their bull calves. And if they are both kept in the same environment, then there is quite a significant chance that bull calves will become infected and then spread the infection on to the heifers within the environment. So don't feed cow's milk to any calves would be a great way of controlling the disease if the disease is present in the herd. Teat hygiene is a real issue and, and, and particularly on automatic feeding systems, the, the teat represents a fantastic way of, of spreading infection between calves, particularly in the early days. Um, uh, so regular disinfection of those teats would be really, really useful. The same is going to apply if automatic feeding systems are not used of any of the utensils that are used to feed milk, whether it's Wydale feeders, whether it is buckets, whatever it happens to be, and also the utensils and the buckets that are used to, to, to collect and move the milk around. Great ways of spreading embovis on, and the hygiene of that is really, really important to limit spread in mycoplasma bovis infected herds. Um, always feed the youngest calves first, um, uh, in that that will maybe limit the spread from older calves to younger calves. And in terms of disinfection, most of the, you know, the, the common disinfectants will work uh, and kill mycoplasma bovis. Um, I, I think the challenge is more, particularly for automatic feeding systems, is, is how to apply it regularly enough to do that. And there is a real need and a real call for you know, these automatic feeding systems, I feel, to uh, you know, not only be able to disinfect the pipe work, but be able to disinfect the teats um, uh, to manage the disease. It's a great way of spreading it and um, needs to be controlled better. When we come on to colostrum, clearly colostrum is really, really important and we can't stop feeding colostrum to calves. So um, in embobus infected herds, the use of pasteurization is a, a very, very useful technique at, at basically making sure that colostrum is disease free um, or, or is, is a low risk, let's put it that way, uh, and we could potentially check that by, by cultural PCR of pasteurized colostrum to make sure that that's working. Uh, so really, really important in, in embobus infected herds, colostrum pasteurization offers a, a real opportunity to limit the spread of disease. Um, uh, if we're going to go to the trouble to do that, then ensuring that the hygiene of, of um, stomach tubes or calf feeders, again, really, really important. Wearing gloves to feed the calves, really, really important. Uh, and, and potentially knowing the status of the dam itself and selecting colostrum from mycoplasma bovis antibody negative calves, may, may cows rather, may offer some scope for control in the future. Um, it probably won't surprise you either that quite a lot of these control measures um, uh, would also apply to other diseases, you know, be it yonis or uh, other neonatal calf diseases as well. You know, a lot of the, the, the common sense approaches to mycoplasma bovis control will also help with the control of other calf diseases as well. In terms of the calf groups and the aerosol spread of disease, then as much as can be done in this area is going to be really, really important. Minimizing group size, uh, and again, that's particularly important on automatic feeding systems, um, uh, to have enough feeding points to be able to limit group sizes, to stop the spread of infection from older calves to younger calves, fixing the groups and trying as best as one can in a continuous calving system, potentially to have an all-in, all-out policy going to be really important. Um, uh, 
And another route for control is segregating calves with respiratory disease. If we can detect them early enough, is segregate them from the rest of the group to prevent disease spreading from uh, a pneumonic calf to a healthy calf. I accept entirely that, that sometimes by the time we detect clinical disease in one calf, it's already quite well established in the group, but uh, it does pose a potential route for control. Wearing gloves when handling calves, improving ventilation and managing the other causes of pneumonia uh, are also critically important in that regard as well. Uh, a nice bit of work that was done by Alex Bach and uh, has been referenced, looked at um, uh, basically the whole grouping issue. They looked at low risk pneumonia groups where there had been no previous pneumonia treated calves within the group. They looked at medium risk groups where two out of the eight calves had had a previous episode of pneumonia. And they looked at high risk groups where five out of the eight um, uh, calves within the group had had a previous history of pneumonia. Um, uh, they put all these batches together um, uh, and then they looked at the, the pneumonia rates within the groups in the different risk categories. And it, this piece of work does start to illustrate quite nicely that uh, you know if we can identify the disease calf as quickly as possible, uh, remove it from the group and treat it in a hospital type environment uh, to protect the rest of the group from the possibility of picking up pneumonia, there may be some uh, scope for control by doing that. A very quick mention at the end of vaccination uh, on vaccination from mycoplasma bovis. Uh, I'm not necessarily advocating this, um, uh, I'm just sharing some experiences, but the, the first thing to say is there is no licensed vaccine in the UK for mycoplasma bovis uh, at the moment. So none of the pharmaceutical companies have a, a licensed vaccine, um, uh, but there is the potential to create what we call an autogenous vaccine um, uh, based on an isolate that is generated on the farm um, uh, to create a vaccine from that isolate to use in animals on that farm. Your vet needs to uh, be involved in this process clearly um, uh, and there is some uh, legislative stuff that needs to be gone through with the veterinary medicine directorate to do it. Um, if we look at the literature, there are variable reports, to be honest, of, of how this will work. There are some reports that say that the vaccine has good effect. Um, there are other reports that suggest that it was fairly equivocal, didn't make that much difference either way. And there was one report from Ireland suggesting that actually the vaccine made the disease situation worse. So by mentioning it, um, uh, vets are using this more commonly uh, now to control mycoplasma bovis. Um, uh, and the sort of vaccines that we're talking about, they, they don't come with the, the same uh, efficacy data that a um, conventional vaccine would purchase from your vet, from a pharmaceutical company. Uh, we don't have to prove that these vaccines work, we just have to prove that they're safe. So they do offer some scope for control, uh, but I'm not guaranteeing by any manner of means that they, they offer the, the same assurance that, that other vaccines would. There is quite a lot of anecdote um, uh, to suggest that the disease control works reasonably well in particularly older animals with pneumonia and arthritis. Um, uh, other things to bear in mind is you need an isolate. There's probably a 10 to 12 week lead in time to get the vaccine produced. Um, there needs to be safety testing done on farm uh, and that safety testing needs to be extended if there are pregnant animals involved in the vaccine use as well. So it's very much an idea that needs to be considered with the vet and the farmer together. Is, is this a route that you might want to go down or can you control mycoplasma bovis by other means? To end on one, um, uh, one example where it has worked really, really well was in a, a beef unit um, uh, where they, over years had ongoing problems with pneumonia in their weaned calves in the autumn, um, uh, usually peaking in December and January, not losing animals but having very, very high treatment rates uh, and by using other vaccines for pneumonia control didn't seem to be getting the effect that they needed to. A range of organisms were involved in this pneumonia outbreak, um, uh, including Mycoplasma bovis. Um, and in 2014-15, they, they decided to go for an autogenous vaccine in addition to other vaccines that they were using to control IVR, um, RSV, PI3, and Pasteurella. Um, uh, and you can see on the graph on the right here how their antibiotic use dropped 
in 2014, 15, 2015, 16 uh, on this unit after they, they'd used the mycoplasma bovis vaccine. Um, uh, and again, this is just one example, but uh, it's not a controlled trial, but it was a, a fairly contented farmer in terms of the outcomes that they got. So my concluding comments, um, mycoplasma bovis Consider the possibility of, of M. bovis infection in relation to the different clinical disease situations that I've described. Um, diagnostics is important with vet pharma combination that uh, the disease is, is accurately diagnosed so that we know that M. bovis is involved and that then can direct control strategies and treatment strategies as required. Consider all of the critical control points for the farm that we talked about. Um, how the disease might be spreading locally on the farm and what practically can you do to limit the spread. Um, uh, with the vet, consider appropriate therapeutics, balancing you know, responsible use of antimicrobials with the need to maintain animal welfare. And I think for the future, our control strategies are going to need to focus much more on eradication of the disease, identifying disease-free herds, and hopefully you know, better vaccines coming along in the future um, uh, that might help us control this disease in a better way. Um, finally, I'd just like to acknowledge people that have helped me with a lot of the work and experiences that we've had with mycoplasma bovis over the years. Um, uh, some of the vets in this area, colleagues from uh, within SAC, within APHA, and mycoplasma experience. Uh, I'd like to thank Jenny Gibbons for her input into the talk from AHTB, and I'd also like to thank the Scottish Government for the support for the animal disease surveillance work that we do based here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin, and um, for that very detailed overview of mycoplasma. <clears throat> it is a very um, complex topic, and it, perhaps the presentation took a little bit longer than, than normal. Um, I think you've given us a great um, focus there on things that we can do in terms of prevention and control uh, at the end of that. It was very important. It's been a great session this, this evening, and I'm sure everybody would like me to to thank you and the team at, at SOUC for um, all the work that's being done on mycoplasma and for bringing us up to date on where we are today with mycoplasma bovis.